All right. So thank you, Gunter, everybody, for coming. Um, let's start talking about this. Uh, so I will remind you about the Galois group of the rational numbers soon enough. It won't take too long. But we have a couple other things to attend to first before we get there. So um, the, the very first point here, um, up or down? Uh, hang on. Uh, the very first point concerns a 14th century French philosopher named Jean Bourdon. Um, possibly some of you will have heard of him, probably not very many, but um, he is remembered today. And he is remembered mostly for his acts. So there it is. <laughs> so, so if you have come across him and you're not deeply in philosophy, um, probably the story you would know is the story of Ridon's ass. Um, it, it's first of all, this story apparently predates him, and it's not clear if he ever told it or if it was more told by his critics making fun of him, um, creating an impossible situation. Um, Buridon was studying free will and determinism and things like this. And he or the critics imagined a situation in which a donkey here was in between two luscious, scrumptious bales of hay. Anybody remember this? I, I see one or two, yeah. Um, pretty good. Um, the only thing is, first of all, the, the two bales were utterly indistinguishable. I mean, you would think this was the same picture or something. <laughs> and, and furthermore, the donkey was exactly halfway in between them. And in the story, the donkey sits there looking this way and looking that way and can never make up its mind which way to go. And in the end, starves to death <laughs> right there in between the two bales of hay. Okay, so as I say, this may well have been told by critics to parody Burlington's own beliefs about free will and determinism. Whatever your beliefs about that, all of our basic reactions to this is to say, okay, well, poor creature, but at the same time, what an ass. <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, um, let me remind you about Koenigsmann. <laughs> nice segue. <segment. Yes. laughs> so Koenig's lemma, this one, I think most or all of you know, every infinite finite branching tree has an infinite path, okay? And, and I would bet most of you could rattle off a proof or just come up with it um, right away here. Um, it's pretty simple. Like that. So I would assume tree for us um, means what you think it means. There is a root, okay? And um, infinite tree means infinitely many nodes, and there should be an infinite path. Starting at the root, there should be a way of going up without ever stopping. Okay. Um, if you're thinking of trees of height greater than omega, then it's obvious that there is some infinite path because a node at level omega would define one. So these trees are finite height or height omega, only finitely many nodes. So the interesting case is height omega. And what you do is pretty simple, right? You say, okay, I mean, there are infinitely many nodes above the root. That's where our path is gonna start. One or the other, of the finitely many, one or another, the finitely many nodes of level one, therefore must have infinitely many nodes above it. So your whichever it is, that's where your path should go. If, if it's both of them, then it doesn't matter, choose either one. And repeat, because wherever you went, there are infinitely many nodes above that. And by induction, as long as we're only trying to go up, you know, omega many levels, um, by induction, you're gonna get a path. Okay, um, so cool. Perfectly nice proof, um, except that I'm a computability theorist. All right, so I want to compute the darn path. Okay, so, so what do we need to know for that? Well, first of all, you need a few assumptions about being able to compute the tree itself, you know, knowing the, the tree that you're dealing with. Okay, so um, for those who, who know how to state this, um, I'm imagining a 
free in the language with the immediate predecessor function. So for every node, there's a computable function that tells you what node is immediately below it. For the root, of course, I guess it just outputs the root or something like that. Maybe you have a constant for the root. Um, and so with that much, the, the first problem is if you if you don't know how many successors a given node has, let's say the root, then you've definitely you're sunk pretty much right away. Um, because it's very possible that you say, oh, here are you know two successors, and you wait and you choose one of them, and then it turns out there was a third node at level one, and that's the one with infinitely many things above it, and you already made your choice and you lost. So so we certainly should assume that the branching function of t is computable, right? The function that tells you for each node how many immediate successors it has. Um, so if I imagine I enumerate the successors and I don't know if the enumeration is done, but if I know that one of them that I have enumerated has infinitely many guys above it. If you know that one of them has infinitely many guys above it, then yeah, you can definitely go there right away. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's what you would have that, to that, that, that sounds like the next thing you want to know here. Um, I'm just going to say for purposes later on, um, one alternative to the branching function being computable is to suppose you've got a decidable subtree of a tree like the complete binary tree where everything, where the branching is trivial, you know, it's just two for every node. So that would be a way to go about this. Yeah, I mean, the, the real question is infinitely many successors. You would wait. Oh, yeah, no. If it's binary, but even if it's terminal, you would have problems, right? Um, I, I mean, in all these cases, you have some problem. What you need to know is which of these, I mean, you know how many choices you have. If the branching function is computable, uh, but no, you still have to choose. Ternary, it could have been. It could be a node with two branches or with three branches. Or unless you mean with oh, ternary means three, oh, not, three, not just two. Absolutely three. Yeah, yeah but the sub the subtree might not be. Oh well, if it's a decidable subtree of, say, the binary tree, then you can say, okay, here it is in the binary subtree. It has exactly two successors in the subtree. Check if this one is in T. Check if that one's in T. So. Okay, get your okay. answers or all one or Right. So, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so okay. So if there is a fairly natural strategy to try here, right? So in this situation, you start at the root. And the basic question confronts you right away. Um, let's say there are only two immediate successors, two nodes at level one. Should I choose A or should I choose B? You don't have to choose right away. You can investigate the tree somewhat further. And so, yeah, I always have to get up and down straight up here. Sorry. Okay. Um, so you investigate and um, you can compute the branching. And, you, and if this one is three branching, you can find those three nodes. And this one's one branching, find its node. You might say A looks like a better bet at this point, but that's certainly mm -hmm. not very definite here. I mean, it could well be that all of a sudden after that, next level B looks like a better bet. Um, this could work, right? I mean, it, it could be that at some point here, um, A goes on to the next level and nothing above B gets to the next level. It could be that the, tree, the portion of the tree above B just sort of dies out at some point. And if that happens, of course, that's great. Then you say, well, they get, right? I mean, if, if one of them is only finite and many successors, terrific. But the earlier the choices are, the more significant they are, right? Well, in some sense, I think I would say if you screw up once, you're toast, right? I mean, so it, it, it's kind of just recursively the same situation over and over, unless you've messed up, in which case you're going to get into a dead but, end. No, but I'm saying if you were to parameterize it in some way, the earlier the choices, the heavier the weight. This might be reasonable. But I would we'd have to figure out about. Not really sure. So okay. So so if this happens, you're good. And if there were A, B, and C at this level, then you'd want to wait until all but one of them had died out, and then pick the one that remains. That sounds good. Okay. But of course, it does still leave this problem if they both have. I mean, never mind this picture now. If they both happen to have infinitely many successors, and you sit there waiting for one or the other, all but one. To die out, then you're just never going to make a choice. Right? 
So first of all, that, that counts as fail, right? I mean, computable means you're supposed to come up with each next step in a finite amount of time. Um, second of all, this is incredibly irritating because in this situation, if there are infinitely many nodes here and infinitely many here, then by Koenig's lemma, both of them have a path through them. So you could have gone either way. They both work perfectly well. And instead you sat there and dithered for the rest of eternity. And at the end of eternity, people looked at you and said, what an ass. Uh, so we've got a bra. Yes. No. You didn't realize you were going to be the ass. <laughs> um, so, well, now that doesn't prove that this is impossible per se, right? But as a matter of fact, there is a computable, decidable subtree of the complete binary tree, um, which has no computable path whatsoever. So it's not even just a question of, is there a uniform way of doing this that would work for all these trees? For this particular tree that I'm going to show you here, there's no way to do it at all. No computable path, full stop. Um, and okay, so, so there, there's a complicated thing that will make sense for those of you who know your computability, but really the way to see this tree and understand it is this tree, which has in mind at the beginning that it will make sure it has no computable path, um, it starts out pretty much putting nodes in, you know, level one, level two here, it's got four nodes. At level three, it's got eight nodes. And that, but as it's doing this, it's, it's, it has a list of all the computable functions, all the partial computable functions, because there is an effective list of them. Um, and it watches the functions on that list. And let's say that at stage four, the first partial computable function. In, in the formula up there, you see E sub E, the ETH partial computable function. Let's say that stage four, the first one on input one halts and outputs one, okay? The tree sees this happen. And at that, at the next level, you know, state, we're talking about stage four because we're about to define level four in the tree. And since phi one chose, to go to the right, I mean, never, P, P1 hasn't even said what it chose at this level, but P1 says at level one, I'm going to go to the right. And so the tree says, ha, 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 all those nodes or all those, that, that half of the tree dies out and the other half survives. So basically you can see no matter what P sub one had chosen, it was going to be wrong. If it had never made any choice, then it's an ass. And thus, and E0 is going to face the same situation right at the origin. E2 will face it at level two, and so on up. I mean, there are only countably many partial computable functions out there. And we have this effective list of them. And we have countably many levels at which to play against them. And that's all it takes. You can build this tree. So, what happens mm -hmm. at the certain stage, two different functions make a declaration? It chooses one. Um, yeah, was, you can look at both of them if you oh, want. Okay. You, you, you could say, you know, look, look at sub e of e for every e left in the stage. Oh, for instance, e, 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 yeah. E, and, and right. So up there, okay. it's yeah. sub e. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering right. about all the numbers. That, that's the diagonalization, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For each function, there's one level where we're making it make a choice. Yeah. And when it makes a choice, we want to say you're wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, and, and of course, to be clear, this tree does wind up being infinite, right? I mean, first of all, even if every computable function made a choice at level E, um, there would still be one path that made the other choice at every level. And as a matter of fact, there are a lot of partial computable functions that never make a choice. You know, there are a lot of asses out there. And, um, and so at those levels, both directions will work. And so, in fact, there will be continual many paths through this tree, but none of them is computable. Hmm. Okay. Um, interesting question, which we'll think about a little bit later. How much information, how much, how strong an oracle would it take to compute paths through trees like these? So, can I ask you? Yeah. Perhaps, uh, perhaps it's a, not a smart question. You, you, you say no computable. Talking about assets. 
Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah right, right. You're right. Yeah. You'll see that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when you say no computable path, you actually meant no internet in computable path. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, so it's some more paths to the internet. But what if you really just not doing that? So you can, so then this would fail because you would have this finite path. But could you build something like that where even the paths, uh, if a path is finite, I guess you would always be able to compute this, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if there is a terminal node somewhere in the tree, yeah. then there's some partial computable function that says go there and then just right. stop. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I so you can only do it. Yeah. Yeah. Path should be an infinite. Okay. Um, yeah, and so we will talk a little bit later about how much you might need to know about this tree or about life in general to compute a path. Um, but I want to get to the Galois theory before we, we go on to, to there. So, I'm just asking, yeah. I mean, so it seems like at first sight, like if you had the predicate that tells you whether a node has infinitely many successors, you would be in good shape, but you would still have the problem that several paths might have, uh, several well, nodes might have. Yeah. So, so you would still have to you you'd still be making a problem. Choice, no, no, but, but, but you check the least one I mean, right yeah, there. You know, yeah. I mean, choice, yeah. right? yeah. So, yeah. so, so that, it's finite as well. So that predicate. But, so that, that, that doesn't really come into it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so I mean, there, there definitely are trees like this that do have computable paths, of course, and ones that have plenty of them. I mean, countably many, no more than that, because there are only countably many computable functions. But um, yeah, some do, some don't. This one doesn't, which is sort of the interesting case. So it's kind of funny because if you have just one path, then you can compute it. That's that's interesting too. If there were only one then you, path, then it's yeah. always just one. Thing that has in it above yeah. it. So you would think having more paths would make it easier to compute because you're more likely to guess it right, but yeah. actually, yeah. Yeah. Did, did everybody get it? If there's only one path, then at every level, all but one node will die out. Yeah. You know, so wait for that to happen. You'll see it when it happens, and then go to the remaining one. Or make guesses. Pick your path. Well, but I mean, I, I, I prefer to be sure about it. <laughs> well, that's exactly this misleading thing, right? If there are, there are several solutions, it's easier in a way because if you could just randomly guess something, the probability that you guess it is higher in a way, right? Because there yeah. are more solutions, but it's not definable then or not no. computable because yeah. you can't say, take the unique one that, that mm -hmm. it works, right? No, it's a cool question. And it comes up in surprising places in mathematics. Um, people who remember Chris Kanaitis' talk last fall might be thinking about something like this right now. In fact, Chris himself, for instance, might be thinking about it. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so let, let's get to the Galois theory and let me start by reminding you what's going on here. Um, absolute Galois group of Q is a equivalent, basically a fancy name for the automorphism group of the algebraic closure of the rational numbers. Is it, is it possible to move the, the other screens that it is can they, you could totally minimize it too. I was just thinking wow. it'd be nice to see it. Um, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. We can bring it back if we need it, when we want it. So, okay. Um, so, yeah. So, um, in general, the absolute Galois group of a field is the group of automorphisms of its algebraic closure that fix the given field. Point wise. Um, if the given field is the rationals, not really a problem because every automorphism is going to fix every rational number. I mean, they're, they're all individually definable in the language of field, so no problem. So we're really just thinking about an automorphism group here. Um, algebraic closure, I would assume everybody's familiar with the algebraic closure of the rationals is the prime model of the theory ACF0, which is complete and decidable and has quantifier elimination and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, okay, so good. Now, number theorists have a bit of trouble dealing with the algebraic closure of Q sometimes. They, they like the complex numbers much better. And uh, a lot of them will say, well, the algebraic closure of Q is sort of floating around inside the complex numbers, but it's hard to say if something in the complex numbers is algebraic over Q or transcendental. And so it's hard to figure. Well, okay, you know, 
they deal with continuum size structures all the time, and it sort of addles their thinking. From my point of view, computability, um, it's quite easy to fix a computable presentation of the algebraic quotient. Okay. Um, this comes from work of Michael Rabin in 1960. And in fact, if the concept of computability existed, you could have done it as far back as the 1880s when Kronecker proved a number of results about being able to decide which polynomials have roots in the rationals, which polynomials factor, and things like this. Um, so I'm not going to go through all those details, but what we're going to do here is to fix one specific computable presentation of this structure. And when I say key bar, that's what I will mean. Um, so, so well, it seems sort of clear how you could enumerate all those solutions somehow computable, but now then additional multiplication. Mm -hmm. How how they become computable? Um, so I'm not sure I want to take the time to go into all of this. But, um, but, but it's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a perfectly good answer. Yeah, you can definitely do the addition of the multiple. Um, I'm, this is the sort of thing that Rabin was investigating. Um, he looked at algebraic closures of computable fields in general. You know, so there may be transcendentals floating around, there could be other characteristics, things like that. And you can always do this, you can always get a computable presentation. Um, in this case, because there are no transcendentals at all, um, it's actually computable categorical. But that's kind of um, so, which it means it doesn't matter what presentation I chose, in fact. Okay, um, other questions about this? I'm about to tell you that it's a very nice structure from the point of view of fields, thinking about the things you would like to do. So um, here are the basics of this computable presentation, Q bar. Um, so first of all, remember number field? Algebraic number simply means an element of Q bar, but number field doesn't mean a subfield of Q bar. It specifically means a finitely generated subfield of Q bar, finite extension of the rations. Um, I don't quite know how that terminology got established that way, but it is. I, I'm not going to fight it. So, um, so, of course, from the point of view of computability, finitely generated things are, are much easier to deal with. and Q bar itself is sort of built out of such things, going higher and higher and higher, such a tower in just a moment. Um, but okay, so essentially this says that everything you would want to figure out about Q bar relative to number fields and about number fields relative to their subfields and things like that is all decidable. Um, so one natural way to think about it, um, if you have a number field given by saying, here's a finite subset of Q bar, a finite set of elements in my structure, K is the number field that they generate. Um, you can decide you, well, you can decide all kinds of stuff about it. Um, first of all, here I'd say you can find a primitive generator of the number field. Right, so... So, so that's supposed to be K equals Q? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes, K, uh, sorry, you're quite right. K equals Q adjoin Z. What's there is true, but it's... it's, 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 it's um, Yes. Okay. Um, so, so a primitive generator that generates the entire number field over the rational numbers, uh, which is just sort of a nice way. This is not unique by any means, but it's a nice way of sort of referring to the number field in a in a specific way, just by one element. Um, and once you know that, um, it becomes decidable. For instance, when you have a polynomial over the number field K, you can decide whether it factors over that field K. For single variable polynomials, you can decide whether it has a root in K. For multivariable polynomials, that's not so clear. That's Hilberstein's problem with the rational numbers and whatnot. But um, so, so there, there's one little pickup in there. But um, you can, you can, um, if K itself is desired, if I say here's a primitive generator, or here are finite many generators, and then I give you any other element of Q bar. There's a decision procedure for whether it is generated by the generators or not. Okay. And putting all of that together, you can actually compute Galois groups of one number field over another. All such groups are finite, of course, so very easy to give. Um, usually, you know, a natural way to give them is to say, okay, an automorphism of a given number field is determined by saying, okay, here's the primitive generator that we have, Z. 
The automorphisms correspond to the conjugates of Z over the rationals within this number here. Okay. I mean, you can, you can, so conjugates, elements that satisfy the same numeral polynomial over the rationals. Um, mapping Z to any one of those does give you an automorphism. And since Z generates the whole number field, it determines the whole automorphism. And conversely, I mean, every automorphism maps Z to one of its conjugates. So those are your automorphisms. Um, that would also work if you wanted to develop a group of K over an L in the number field within K. And then you need to know about factoring over L, but we know all those things. Okay, so generally, I mean, with, with the one exception of worrying about whether a multivariable polynomial has a solution in the number field, we pretty much decide whatever we want. Yeah. Yeah. You decide it for some number? Um, like low, like two. And yeah, I mean, an obvious question two. I'm not sure of the answer for that. I, I'm not aware that it's known for two, but what makes it so long? I mean, it took 70 years to do this for Z, for God's sake. Q were only up to about 50 years past that. So, <laughs> so um, I mean, when Hilbert says something is a problem, it's a problem. <laughs> Okay, so so that's Q bar. That that's the field that we want to work with, the algebraic closed end Q. Um, and we want to talk about its automorphism. Okay. Um, okay, so to attack that, as I said already, it's very useful to think of Q bar as being built up using these number fields. And uh, I'm going to do it in, in a slightly special way. I, I would like, given everything on the last slide, it's pretty easy. To build this up in such a way that at each step, the number field you have is what they call normal over the rationals, which means for every element in the field, all of its conjugates are also in the field. Okay. Um, and so, so, so there's a little bit of information here about how to go about that. And look at the, if you have F sub n for some n, F sub zero is just the rationals itself, which are decidable. Um, for each n, take the first element of Q bar, you know, in, in the enumeration of the domain of Q bar, um, that is not in Fn. If you just took the field it generates, that might not be normal, but you can say, okay, find all of its conjugates and take the field generated by all the conjugates, and then find a primitive generator, that's the Zn plus one up there, of that normal field, which has all the conjugates. And, so Q bar is not finally generated. Q bar is definitely I'm not. I was asking this question from number. It's mm -hmm. not that easy to show. It's not some kind of trivial um, well, I mean, I, I would start by saying that there are irreducible polynomials on Q of arbitrarily high degree. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, you know, X to the prime P minus 2 is always irreducible. Oh, I see. So, so and, um, just take the P so, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> So, okay, so we do this and we wind up with a power of subfields whose union is all of Q bar. I guess we just go through and always make sure that the next element that's not yet in goes into the next state. Okay. Um, and so if you have an automorphism, so I guess first point about automorphisms of of Q bar is that because these fields F0, F1, F2, and so on are normal over Q, each automorphism of Q bar must fix Fn setwise, not pointwise, but it maps Fn onto Fn. Okay, normality gives you that. If you didn't have normality, you wouldn't. So, um, great. And given that, the, every automorphism of Q bar is determined just by saying, first of all, what does it do on F1? F0 is trivial. Right. What does it do on F1? What does it do on F2? What does it do on F3? And so on up. So it's the sequence that you see here. F of Z1, F of Z2, dot, dot, dot. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, F of Z2 determines F of Z1. Right? I mean, F of Z2 determines the entire automorphism of F2, and, the, and that restricts to an automorphism of F1, and that Tells you what F of Z1 must be. So that's how this works. Um, 
And yeah, so also we, we can compute for each dn exactly how many conjugates it has. That's another one of the easy facts about U bar. Um, and so, so the automorphism looks like a path where you say, at, you start at the root, and at the first level, you say, where does Z1 go under this automorphism? You know, find it with many choices, the conjugates of Z1. You know exactly how many there are, so you can compute, right? And those are precisely the automorphisms of F1. Or the whole automorphism of Z bar has to restrict to one of those on F1, okay? And then you say, all right, what does it do on F2? And it, it can't just pick any of the conjugates anymore because it's constrained a bit by its choice for F1, where did it map Z1? But you can say exactly what the choices, the remaining choices are for where Z2 goes. And the automorphism picks one of them on up, okay? This tree is not hard to find a path. In case you wonder, I think that is out there. Yeah. There, is, uh, there I mean, is no terminal. There is no terminal node here. You know, we never did anything stupid anywhere along the way. So wherever you are, you're on a path. Um, there's also a path that corresponds to the identity automorphism, um, where you just say z1 maps to z1. You might think of that as maybe the leftmost path, but quite possibly, whatever. Um, so, so no issue, no brutal issues here. Yeah. Um, but this, this is setting everything up, right? And so we have this tree um, symmetric. It, there's a lot of symmetry to it, right? I mean, at every every node at level n has exactly the same branching at level n plus one. Okay, um, so on up, yeah. And so that's that's the tree that I will call T Q bar. The paths through it are precisely the automorphisms of Q bar. Um. It makes sense, therefore, to talk about a computable path. Right? Why not? Perfectly good. Okay. Um, and yeah, so, so assuming things make sense here, there are, of course, continual many paths. The automorphism group of Q bar has, has two continuum. Um, so the, counter, the computable ones are not very many of them. Okay, but they're out there. And they do, in fact, form a group. Okay, which follows when you think about this last paragraph. Um, the last paragraph says there's a way to take any pair of automorphisms and compute their composition. What do you do? Well, okay, so, so it's F and G here and you want to get G composed with F. So you say, okay, first of, at level one, what does F do to Z1? And you know, if you know F, you know the answer. You can find f of z1, and that's part of the information or that part of the path. And then you want to say, what does g do to that? Well, you know what g does to z1. z1 generates all of f1, all of the field f1. In particular, z1 generates little f of z1. It's in that field. And so knowing where z1 is mapped by g, you can figure out where f of z1 is mapped by g. Which means you computed G of F of Z1. But you can computably figure out. That sounds and a little. Totally yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds a little obvious to me, but I mean, I believe. Oh, um, okay, yeah. It, it, it's basically all sort of arithmetic on the field. Okay. Yeah. It, it, uh, so I guess I try it this way. Um, I, I said F of Z1, whatever it is, is generated by Z1. Yeah, so you can find You it, can yeah. search and figure out how is it generated. It's, mm -hmm. you know, Z1 squared yeah. minus 61 plus 18 or something. So, and, and then you say, you know, where Z1 goes, or this goes. That's automorphism. That's the big rules. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, so you can compute products. Uh, um, and you really only need, you, you can compute F of, or G of F of Zn without even looking beyond the field Fn. Right, so you don't need all that much of the path at, at any given stage um, to compute the whole down product on all of Q bar. Of course, you need the path F and the path G and the way up. But still, it's it's not that difficult a process. It, it's not one of these, you know, wait until longer than the age of the universe to find the answer and then say, aha, I've got it. <laughs> Pretty quick. Um, likewise, you can compute the inverse of an element, right? I mean, if, if, 
you could, it, I mean, okay, F maps Z1 to F of Z1. Well, you want to know what, what does F map to Z1? Mm -hmm. Well, it's got to be something out there. In fact, it's got to be one of the conjugates of Z1. So just try F on all of them. Mm -hmm. One of them is going to work. So it's tempting to say that this is a computable presentation of R of Q bar as a group. I'm going to shy away from that because we use the term computable presentation for countable structures. This is not a countable structure. And, and it's not just the computable R one, right? I'm presenting to you mm -hmm. the tree and the paths through this tree are all on metaphysics, many, many of them. So let's not call it a computable presentation, but it's about as effective a presentation as one could wish for a structure of size continuum. We've done things like this for structures like the real numbers, the field of real numbers, um, and that's harder because the, you know different paths name the same real number. Here, it's actually really nice. You know, one path for each element of the group, and also the tree is actually by branch, which hasn't played into this yet, but it will. So, questions then here. Um, Let's see. So, so I said we could talk about computable order morphisms. In fact, you can relativize this for any Turing degree B. You can talk about the decomputable automorphisms, and they form a group. Okay. Yeah. Um, every automorphism has some degree, in fact. So if you put all of these subgroups together, they cover the whole group. But what I'm interested in right now, um, if I look at, let's say, just the computable automorphisms, is that an elementary subgroup? Of the absolute power of group or two. I would use your motivation. Okay. So elementary subgroup, first of all, would mean it has the exact same theory as the automorphism group as the big But more than that, um, I I'll I'm going to go ahead with I mean, first of all, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, I, I just I don't want to get your hopes up. Um, but second of all, I'm going to go ahead with a way of just starting to investigate it at the lowest level, and that will probably explain what more has to happen than just, oh, they have the same theory. Okay. Yeah. No, sure. Um, okay. Questions? Anybody else? Anything? So, okay, then. So, so mm -hmm. yeah. Can the models directly be set in advance about A0? About the smallest sub group. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so just a few things. First of all, people who talk about Galois groups, I, some of you may be in that category of doing this a lot. This is nowhere close to a closed subgroup. Okay, right there, there's a topology on the automorphism group Q bar. Um, and it, it's based on exactly the tree. You know, the open sets are the automorphisms that go through one specific node of this tree. Basic open sets are automorphisms that send, you know, Z1 to its sixth conjugate and Z2 to its fourth conjugate. Well, you know, for arbitrary values of six and four. <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, and that matches up with this very well. But for every node. In this tree, you know, the node just says, okay, it's at level n, and it says, you know, f must map zn to this particular conjugate of zn, f of zn. Um, there's always a computable automorphism that does. I mean, you can do that and then say just thereafter, always pick the least available conjugate the rest of the way up, um, which means that the computable automorphisms are dense in this group. So, and they're definitely not the whole group, they're close. So, so it's clearly not a closed subgroup, mm -hmm. which is disappointing from one point of view. Closed subgroups are the things where you can do nice Galois theory and say, oh, there's a fixed field and what is it, you know, and all of that. Um, we can't do that here, okay? I mean, for every D, this is dense. But I mean, these subgroups are nested, of course, as, as D goes up in Turing reducibility. So if, if zero is dense, if it is, then, they're all dense. They're all super of that. Um, so, yeah. So, I don't think these have come up a lot in Galois theory in general. I mean, people haven't done a lot of computability on it. 
And you know, the, the whole Gallant correspondence is so nice, of course. You know, close some rogues and pick the and some field and all this. Um, it's kind of a shame to lose that. So you can understand why people are stuck to the but I would think there are some obvious models here, right? Yeah. That can be said. Um, what anything well, that might be on saturation, all kind of things. Ah, okay. Um, anything well, uh, so let's start with this question, okay? Um, and that may get us somewhere on it. Um, but before even you do that, uh, how rigid is it? If you have a different representation, the, the computable, mm -hmm. okay. Um, let's because once you, have, once you have your uh, your uh, computation, computational representation, everything. Follows from there, right? Your yeah. construction was yeah. very, yeah. Mm -hmm. The choice of the presentation of Q bar, mm -hmm. I said was basically irrelevant. And the reason is if you choose one presentation of Q bar and I choose another, yeah. there will be a computable isomorphism between them. So, and that essentially lets you translate everything from your item. copy over to yeah, corresponding thing about mine. But it is also, it's up to isomorphism, really, but not unique. No, no, it's not um, a single option. Yeah, I mean, it, it does depend on, uh, well, the automorphism that sends Z1 to Z1 in your copy yeah. may send Z1 yeah. to Z2 in my yeah, copy yeah. because the automorphism. That's not quite true. No, it may send Z2 to Z3 in my yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the automorphism between them yeah, yeah, yeah. does strange things. The isomorphism. Yeah, sure. yeah okay. Um, let's go for elementary. I mean, I want to come back to this question and make it clear. What, what would need to happen for bot zero of QR to be an elementary subgroup is not just that they should satisfy the same theory, but that anytime you have a situation of, I'm going to read it off down here, anytime you have a, a formula that's true in Q bar and that's allowed to have parameters from Q bar, so, so the F, the G is just the variable is G, but F is a specific automorphism in Q bar. If the, if the F is in the smaller group, then this formula should hold with the same F in the smaller group as well. Okay. That's, that's for all formulas. Um, it, it's most important for existential formulas because universal ones sort of half this property of going down anyway, at least if you know that simpler formulas go back and forth mm -hmm. and universal ones will go down. But that's a good question, right? Somebody gives you an F. So, so the really simple formula I have here is talking about F, it's sort of a square in the Gell one. If F is computable and it is a square in the Gell one group, is there a, 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 okay, so that says in the in the Galois group there's a G, such a G close to G equals F. Is there such a G that's computable? <laughs> of course, such a G would be a path. Okay, but the tree is not going to be the whole thing anymore. So this is where we're going to start thinking about what happens. Um, let's see. I think. Yeah, so, so in, I'm first going to look at this in terms of trees, and then we'll talk about actually trying to figure out what happened. I already told you I don't know the answer, but there are interesting things to think about. So, um, so trying to compute, compute specifically, come up with a computable G whose composition with itself equals F. Um, well, so we say, okay, look, first of all, in F1, what does F do? Well, you know, map Z1 to some conjugate Z1, possibly itself. Um, and how could we define G on Z1 so that doing G and then G again matches what F does? You know, maps Z1 after two steps to F of Z1. And you can figure out what the possibilities are because you can compute the Galois group, the finite Galois group of F1 over Q. Um, you're guaranteed that F1 is a square in this sense because it's the square of something in odd Q bar, just not necessarily computable. But so it's got to be a square. Um, and so you can say, okay, well, what are the possibilities? You know, there, 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 are, there are only finite many automorphisms of F1, which of them square to F? At least one. Or even find all of them. Maybe all of them. You can determine all of them. Right. They're all possibilities. Which one should you choose? 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's not <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. Um, start bringing everybody. Uh, <laughs> but no, this, this is, I mean, I'm just, this elementary stuff so quick. If you have an F that is a square or something, then are all such Fs in that elementary subgroup? Like, um, it's sort of the other way around. The subgroup will be elementary if every F in it, here in the big group, is already a square in the little group. Right, but by definition, they're all in it, right? Um, you, you, you say, yeah, you start by saying every F in the little group that happens to be a square in the big group is already a square in the little group. Right, but if they are a square in the big group, they are not automatically in the little group. It, it, right? it, 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 yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I should just say, it's not just the property of being squares. Of course, it's all formulas have to behave this way over their parameters. So that then you okay. can figure out the what would be. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you, I mean, that would be a task. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let, let's leave it. At <laughs> um, so, yeah. So what we're facing here is precisely the problem of defining this tree up here. Well, defining it is not hard, but then computing a path. Right. Is, does it have a computable path? And again, some trees do, right? Don't give up hope here. It might work. Um, but yeah, but the, the tree simply says at each level, figure out what F is at that level and look at the possible square roots. It's square roots in the sense of the group, the possible genes that's, that compose with themselves and give you F. And there's always got to be one, so it's an infinite tree. Okay. So these, these operations of, 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 yeah, of, of, of composition of these automorphisms, I mean, that's basically ellipsoids. They are ellipsoids continuous, right? Because if you know the first n digits of two oh, of them. Oh, yes. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That, that's exactly. Yes. Absolutely. I, I had not used the word ellipsoids for them before now, but yes, that's exactly the property. And so you probably can do this for any formula, right? Like just you look at. You know, the, basically look at all the truncations to like yeah. n. And, uh, we should think about if it truncates successfully to every n, does that automatically give you a realization yeah. and stuff? But yeah, so there are some questions, but yeah, definitely. It, um, thank you for thinking of the word Lipschitz. I, as I say, uh, I will use that from now on. <laughs> so, um, okay, so yeah, so open question, open as of now, as far as I know. Um, does this tree have a computable path or not? Right? I mean, will this tree make an ass of us? We might find one. Okay. Um, well, so so let's uh, we, let's be brave. Let's try to try. Let's try. Um, sometimes you can figure out how to find the first step here. And so, example, um, for the sake of argument, let me suppose that the very first C1 that you get to is the square root of five. Okay, might be, why not? Um, so, okay, now there, there's not a lot you can do with the square root of five as an automorphism. You either fix it or you map it to its negative. Those are the only two modules. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's two automorphisms of that field. Both of them square to the identity. So I guarantee you, without even looking at the oracle graph, the information about that, I guarantee you, as a root five equals root five. That doesn't tell us anything about G. Right? G could be either. Hmm. Okay. Well, remember, you know, the strategy in some cases is let's be patient and see if one of the paths, you know, we've got two possible out, two possible paths right now. Let's see if one of them dies out. Um, and in this case, at some point up there, we will get to that. I, I said here, Zn actually is a primitive fifth root of unity. Um, that won't necessarily happen, but you'll get to some Fn that contains the primitive fifth row. So, you know, contains all four of them because they're all kind of to each other and they have normality. Um, and so, so it, it, there's no real loss in saying, okay, but let's assume F Zn is that fifth row. It, it might as well be, it doesn't, you know, the automorphisms of the automorphisms, whatever they got. It doesn't really matter. Um, so, Primitive fifth root of unity, where did you come up with this one from? Well, the answer is it works. Um, that, that's all it has to do. But here, um, how does it work? Um, what happens with fifth roots of unity? Um, maybe I'm just going to do a quick little picture of the complex plane here. 
Um, so this one to be Lindy will only on the unit circle. Um, so data one might be any of the four that you can choose here. There, there's something like that. You know, the last one here is data four, and of course, one itself is not primitive. Um, something like that. And it turns out that if you add this one and this one together, multiply by two and add one. So let's see, sort of adding them comes out like this, multiply by two, add one, you get out here to, in this picture, the positive fifth root of two, um, fifth root of positive square root of five. What did I say about two? And zero zeta five. I'm sorry. So two zeta five plus zeta five to the fourth plus one. Exactly what it says up there. Um, now it's a little bit arbitrary drawing it this way. I mean, first of all, which is the fifth root of five and which is its negative? You know, they could it could be either way. Second of all, um, if if you pick a random primitive fifth root, it could be the one out here. And in that case, well. Same formula works, these two added together, multiplied by two, adding one back gives you the negative square root of five, square root of five, yes. Okay, um, so, so what I'm saying is basically among the primitive 50 to one, pick one of the ones which has the property that when added to its, its inverse, which is this complex conjugate here, and doubled and added one, you get, the particular, you get Z1, whichever square root of five has. So one way or another that can be chosen, you can check it, you can make sure you've got the right ones. Um, now, what happens? Well, okay, there are, so the, for the primitive fifth roots here, um, the Galois group is the cyclic group on four elements. That means there are two squares in that group. Um, if you, first of all, the, the identity squares are the identity. Obviously the identity is gonna be a square. Um, the complex conjugation map also squares with identity. If you send zeta five to zeta five squared and then do that map again, well, zeta five squared will map to zeta five squared squared, which is this. And also if you send zeta five to zeta five cubed, you will get zeta five to the ninth, which is again this because the fifth power is one. Okay, so there are two perfect squares in this group. You can compute f, so figure out which of those two squares f is. Oh, it's got to be one of them. Mm -hmm. okay. And then look at the argument here. So first of all, first bullet point, if f of zeta 5 equals zeta 5, that, that leaves two possibilities for g. Right? Either it's the identity or it's the conjugation map. Um, but in both of those cases, I mean, if g either fixes these two or it transposes them, either way, G is going to fix this. Whereas, second bullet point, if F is the non-identity square, the complex conjugation, then G must have mapped zeta five to either zeta five squared or zeta five cubed. And again, that means that, you know, whichever it was, it'll map its, let's see, it will map the inverse of this to the other one, those two are inverses. And so it will fix, um, it will, sorry, and so it will map um, the square root of five, writing it out here, takes the square root of five, says, well, it's this, apply g, you get data five squared plus data five cubed, one way or the other, right? Whatever it, whatever it is. Um, and that equals negative square root of five. So knowing what F did on the primitive fifth roots of unity tells you what G did on the square root of five. Doesn't tell you, by the way, what G does on the fifth roots of unity. And there's still a couple of choices there. But going far enough up in the tree got you some information about which way G should go down here. Right, I mean, essentially this says at some point, one or the other of these two choices dies out. Which is it? Well, you've got to, follow S far enough up. So in this case, it was good to be patient. This question, does that always work? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, 
you know, I'm getting a little optimistic now. Um, so you know, square root of two. Square root of two is actually pretty easy to find, uh, you know, one of these generation things. Um, if you look at the primitive eighth roots, so there's only four primitive eighth yeah, roots, right? right? Yeah. yeah, and you know, this is one, so, and it's 45 degrees, so this will be root two over two. And so if you add this to its complex conjugate, you get exactly to the square root of two. Cool. Okay, I like that. That's good. Um, once again, f being a square definitely fixes the square root of two. You don't even have to check. Um, and yeah, and so down here, this is zeta eight. This is zeta eight to the seventh power. The sum of those two is the square root of two. So let's let's try this out. Hey. Um, okay, so the conjugates again are the are the other three sort of you know non horizontal vertical right not not negative one not i or negative i but the third fifth and seventh powers if you square those well let's see I mean zeta eight cubed if you square it you get zeta eight cubed cubed which is zeta eight to the ninth which is one because zeta eight to the eighth equals one uh, I'm sorry it's not one. Zeta, is yeah. zeta eight cubed cubed is zeta eight to the ninth, which is zeta eight, right? Because zeta eight to the eighth power is one. Okay. Um, if you cube, if you square zeta eight to the fifth, you get zeta eight to the twenty fifth. Twenty five mod eight is one again. If you square zeta eight to the seventh, seven squared is forty nine mod eight. That's equal to one. So all of these four, which are the only automorphisms of this Galois group, all four of these square to the identity. This is a different Galois group, basically, right? It, it's no longer the cyclic group on four elements, it's E2 plus E2, the Klein four group. So, um, so there's only this one possibility for F, and that means you can't figure anything out from it about G. You know, G could still be any, I mean, I wasn't, expecting to figure out g of zeta eight, of course, but I was hoping for something about g of the square root of two and didn't really get it, right? I mean, depending, you know, uh, some of these things since square root of two is negative, yeah, and there are four possible automorphisms of zeta eight and its conjugates. Two of them since square root of two is negative, two of them fix square root of two, but that doesn't tell me which Two or you know what, which ones I'm looking at. The, the order of your power one is wrong. Yeah. So maybe the, so the answer to does this always work? Well, not right off the bat, no. Yeah, but you don't know. There could be another. But there's plenty more possibilities. Right? Yeah. Um, at this point, we need some number theorists here. Yeah, I think basically. So. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've asked one or two. I haven't really gotten answers out of them. The best way to ask them is to make this into a game. Uh -huh. You know, I give you an F, you've got to give me a G. I promise my F works, but you've got to come up with a G. But now the question is, given an input ZN, you know, you want to compute G of ZN, and we always use some finite amount of F Figure out how to, to figure out what G of Z entered. I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay, partial answer. There are some situations where it seems like you never know. Um, so the example here, if that is the identity, nothing ever tells you what should happen to the square root of negative one, like I square root of negative one. I mean, complex conjugation squares to the identity. The identity itself squares the identity. So there, there's no point at which you say, oh, here's where I should map I. Should I map to itself or to its negative? Those are the only two choices, but which one should it be? Um, hmm. Well, now, in that case, in some sense, it seems like, well, that's not so bad, right? Because at least if I know that F is the identity, then I know that both paths go on infinitely long. And so I'm not in the ass situation, right? I mean, if, if I know that both choices work, 
I'll take one of the two choices. Thank you. The F didn't do that. That was exactly right. what well, I did. Yeah, I so so <laughs> the real situ the situation where you become an ass is where you aren't sure. Okay. Will their you? eventual will one of them cut off eventually okay. and then I sort of take the other? Or will they both go on forever? In which case I can go ahead and take either one. Let me do it right now. Yeah. And that I don't know if it's possible to determine that in general. Okay. So so far this sounds like a talk with no conclusion whatsoever. Really interesting problems, which are which are worth something. But ultimately you're saying it's always better to make a choice. Well, I, I mean, if, if making the choice means that you wind up without an automorphism, I don't see why it was better. Because you have more information. Mm. If you fail, you have information. If you make no choice, you have no information. Making the choice doesn't really give you information. You're just you're trying to build G. Mm -hmm. it, it, all right, all right. I mean, I, 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 that, we're seeing it different ways. That's all. Um, if, you, so, yeah. if you get to the end and you can backtrack. So, so if you allow guessing and stuff, then then this is different. I'm just saying, if you make a mm -hmm. bad choice, and then you can incorporate that choice into mm -hmm. your next choice. Yeah, but you can keep right. Making but but if you want a computable automorphism, I, I that that that's yeah. But okay. But so so what I'm going to go ahead with, on the other hand, is um, but, okay. But before you mm -hmm. yeah, when okay. you say not always, is this your only example? Because F is the identity. I can see that that's actually the one thing you can Yeah, so, so this is this is one encouraging thing here. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the I is special. Yeah. In, right, I mean, I, I you know, from, I mean, uh, well, okay. Well, uh, one is not a prime number to me. That's the degree of this automobile. One is not a prime number. <laughs> I, I think that's great. Okay. That's, um, <laughs> okay. If F has some order, then yeah. I think you can play with things that are um, uh, relatively prime in that order. Okay. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, there is this special thing about I, though, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the um, what is it? Algebraic closure of Q has order two over the real closure, and there are certain sort of conjugates of the real closure over which it has order two. But that's the only way it can have finite order over any subfield. And so, th this is something called the Arkin Schreier theorem. Which I only learned about in the last year. Um, Wait, say that again. Let's, let's say that again. So if F is a subfield of Q bar, yeah, and the degree of Q bar over F is finite, yeah, then that degree is two, right? And yeah. F is either the real closure of Q, yeah. or it can be a it can be sort of a conjugate of that by yeah. some right. automorphism. It's automorphism. a real closed field. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and so that's so something special about I that way. I, I mean, you, you, that, that's yeah, okay. saying right. I, it, it's very plausible okay. to me that maybe you have to make a lucky guess about I, but right. then you could do this. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Something yeah, like that. What you mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so it might be a computable but non-uniform procedure. Uh -huh. Someone one one finite piece of information needed, then you can do it. Um, so yeah, lots of things out there. But okay, I do have some. Good answers for you. It's just not quite about this question. Um, and Susan was saying about what if you're allowed to track back a little bit? What if you're allowed to make some guesses? So let's come from a different side. Um, and I, I mentioned this just in passing when we got to the point of playing the ass. Um, so how hard is it to compute a path to an infinite decidable subtree of a complete binary tree or of TQ bar? Which, you know, Seems like it comes to the same thing. Um, and there are answers to that. For, I mean, the first answer you saw already, it's not always computer. There are such trees with no computable path. Um, the history, um, Kreisel observed, I would say, because it's pretty <laughs> obvious, that if you have a zero prime oracle, you can compute a path. So the tree is still computable, right? But if you happen to know the whole thing problem, you can say, you know, you're looking at A and B once again. You can say, is there a level above A at which there are no successors of A? Right? That's an existential question. Uh -huh. right? And so zero prime will answer it. If you have a zero prime oracle on hand, you can say, oh, well, is there a level or not? And if there is, definitely choose B. Yeah. If there is, you might as well choose A right now, or you could ask the same thing about B if you're compulsive and you want to know. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
1960 Schoenfield proved that you can do better than that. Every infinite decidable subtree has a path whose degree is below zero prime. Okay, which is weird. Zero prime would have been the expected answer here, given that there aren't always computable paths. But Schoenfield said that you can do better. And 12 years after that, the low basis theorem of Dr. Schoenfield established that not only you can do a little bit better, you can get almost down to computable. Okay, so you can in every infinite decidable subtree of complete binary tree, you have a path of low degree. So low means that if you take the jump of the path, if you take the halting problem relative to this path, it's only as hard as the halting problem itself. So that's the Schoenfield didn't give any information about the degree. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. So I, 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 I should go and read through that one closely. But I said it's an easier argument. Or is it something um, that... Well, th th there is information about the degree, Jockers, and so on. And so that sort of trumps it. Right. 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 But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I don't know for sure. Schoenfeld, don't think he got any single degree. Uh, I mean, that would be of interest if he did. I might know about it. But in any case, um, Jockers and Solar eventually proved that, yeah, there are paths which aren't necessarily computable. It may not be a computable path, but there's always a path which is so close to computable that its halting problem is just the same as the halting problem relative to a computable set. Okay, that's what low means. That, that's a well known concept of computability, right? Okay. And more than that, Jockers and Solar showed there's a single low degree that can do this for every. Infinite decidable subtree, which is, I think, what Roland was asking about Schoenfield was on just now. Um, so, yeah, so, so there is such a degree. Um, and the, the terminology here, it turns out that this took some proof. I know who did this, and I don't offhand. Help me if anybody knows. But the degrees that can do this are exactly the degrees of complete consistent extensions of Peano or anything. And so they're known as the PA degrees. Um, so, yeah, um, if you're thinking of complete consistent extensions of Peano arithmetic, they are exactly the paths through an infinite decidable subtree of two to the less than omega, right? Because you, you 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 line up your formulas and you want to decide for each one: is it in my theory or is it out? Well, in or out? And if what you did was inconsistent, you worked out. So if what you did was inconsistent, eventually you'll see the inconsistency and you'll chop off those paths and keep the others. Okay. And so with a tree like that, event, you know, the, the, the paths that actually go up all the way up to level up, you know, omega many levels, um, those are exactly the complete consistent extensions of PA. But you mean consistent. Uh... Uh, they don't prove a contradiction. No, but you don't know just what extension means? No. To you, maybe. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm teaching the first year course right now, so I'm not oh, careful. Oh, oh, okay. um, but yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, so if you remembered something like the incompleteness theorem, you would have known right away that there are infinite decidable subtrees of two to the less than omega with no computable paths. But it turns out there are low ones. There are, you know, low degree complete extensions of PA, of TFC, you know, you pick your favorite desirable axiom set. Consistent desirable axioms of the units. Okay, so so those are of interest, therefore. Um, and so let's talk about sort of the worst case scenario for that F equals G composed with G situation. We built a tree T, remember, where we said at each level, take the G's whose square restricted, whose, when you restrict them to Fn, their square equals F. That's a decidable tree, uh, computable branching, it's a subtree of the TQ bar, the tree of all automorphisms. Um, and so it has a path of low degree. Right? And so, in particular, so that path is, of course, an automorphism whose square equals f. So if we go just a little bit beyond the computable degree, we can get something, which sort of corresponds to being able to backtrack a little bit to, to guess and then revise your guess, and not even all that much. I mean, 
doing that in general would be zero prime computable. This is even better than that. Does it do low degrees for this outcome? But the outcome works good. Good question, and the answer is no. And it takes some work to show it. But yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, so, yeah. So, so natural, I, I mean, that was very much the natural question here. If, if you take the, the set of all automorphisms of Q bar of low degree, Maybe that would be an elementary software, or at least sort of elementary for the signal one formulas. And it's not because it's not a subgroup. It's possible to take two low degree automorphisms, compose them with each other, and you may get something that is not of low degree. Okay, and I'm not going to go and do that proof right now. It's fairly elementary number, elementary enough that I can do it. So, okay. well, what if you just take a, a helping problem or called prime? Um, well, so uh, so the, that, the problem there group. is that should be a group, no? okay. Well, I mean, that is that, a group. That, that is a group. That, that, right. Anytime you say everything yeah. that's t computable is on yeah. D, that's a group. Right. Um, yeah. What I would do then is to take a d computable, a oh, okay. computable perfect square, and build a tree like this. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's a way to do that, which we don't know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. That, you know, it's sort of the same situation. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just okay. probably have to do it. Mm -hmm. probably yeah, <laughs> we say relativizing. But oh, okay, yeah. that's okay. 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 Um, so yeah, so okay. yeah, so so that tree has a has not only a path, you know, the, the witness that already existed in our bar, but it has a low path. Um, and so, okay, question of course, what can we do with more complicated equations than g composed with g equals f? Okay, um, well, partial answer. And so this, this uses um, a bunch of other stuff here. Um, the, uh, Bronka, Debrecht, and Pauli um, 10 years ago proved a uniform version of the low basis theorem. So they gave a Turing functional where you give it any oracle set you want, A, and it, the idea is it should compute or sort of compute um, a low PA degree relative to A. Saying it that way doesn't make sense because you can't, A cannot compute a PA degree relative to A. And I should even say something about the phrase, um, PA relative to A, there's only one PA, right? A on a arithmetic. But the phrase a PA degree, remember it's equivalent, being a PA degree is equivalent to saying this degree can compute a path through every computable finite branching infinite tree, a degree which can compute a path through every a computable finite branching infinite tree is called a PA degree relative to A. And I'm not aware that there's any sort of A relativization of piano arithmetic itself, although maybe, you know, this is an interesting question. Um, but in any case, that's what the phrase means, PA relative to a degree so D means that you can compute paths through any decomputable finite branching tree. So the other group didn't just relativize? Um, well, uh, so, so the, the proof about the last page was the degrees that can compute paths through computable trees like this are exactly the degrees of complete consistent extensions of Peano or arithmetic. Okay, so the degrees that can compute paths through all decomputable trees like this should be what? Complete consistency extensions of computable payano, right? The, the, what is decomputable payano arithmetic? How do you relativize the axioms at PA? Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, there's no obvious way to, I don't, I don't see any obvious way to do that. Talk to Roman, he would know that. Talk to Chris. But, um, you know, there, so, but anyway, the phrase, PA degree relative right. to yeah. you know, D or A or whatever it's come, yeah. has come in. And so the theorem here says for every Turing degree A, well, I'll, I'll tell you the procedure, and then I'll tell you what happens here. The procedure is we use the uniform low basis theorem to compute an A1, well, to, to approximate an A1 that is PA relative to A. You can't compute it relative to A. I, I said approximate. What you actually do is you approximate its jump relative to A. And if there's an A computable approximation of the jump, then the jump is reducible to A jump 
And so A1 is low relative to A. So this is the uniform low basis theorem. It takes a little bit of time to get your head around it. We don't have that much time, so I'm going to keep going. But, um, but it gives you a, a, an A computable approximation to an A1, which is a PA degree relative to A and is low relative to A. And then from A1, you can get a computable approximation to A2, which is a PA degree relative to A1 and low relative to A1. And if you're low relative to A1, your jump is computable to A1 jump, but A1 jump is computable in A jump because A1 is low relative to A. So if you, if you do low over and over and over again, it's always still low relative to the very first thing. Okay, so, so you wind up with this infinite sequence, A1 and 2A3, each degree is PA relative to the previous one and low relative to the previous one. And if you take all the degrees which are below some a n, you know, for, for the degree such that there exists an n where this degree is below a n, then you get something called a Scott ideal of Turing degrees. And that does give you a sub. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, 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 you know, any two automorphisms in it are both computable from some a n, and therefore so is the product. The product is it. Okay. Um, and then you apply an old theory of um, mainly Spectre, I think Cooney and Post were his advisors, this is back in the 1950s, which says that if you have an infinite sequence, infinite increasing sequence of degrees, A1, A2, A3, just like we've got, there's some B and some C, such that the degrees I just described, which are, which are below one or another a n, are exactly the degrees that are below both b and c. Mm -hmm. So instead of this whole power of degrees, you can sort of define it very cleanly just by this b and this c. Um, you can say that the, the, the group in question is the intersection of the group of b computable automorphisms with the group of c computable automorphisms, intersection of subgroups, of course, is a subgroup. And that will have the property that for every degree in it, there's a PA degree relative to that degree in the same ideal. So there you're sort of closed under being able to take paths through trees. And at the same time, you haven't gone very far up relative to the A that you started with because my contribution here was to show that you can get the B and the C both to be low relative to A. In fact, their join is low relative to A. So, so we don't know so much about the group of A computable automorphisms, but we can get something not much further up where you can always take, if, if you can get a computable tree whose paths are the answers, then one of the answers is in your group. Okay. So that means that, um, uh, let's see. I, I think I want to jump ahead right now. Um, okay. I don't think I wrote down the actual theorem then. What that says then is that, oh, no, this just says there are such degrees. Um, so if you look at the subgroup, start with any A you want, close under this, find the B and the C, and look at the subgroup of B computable and C computable automorphisms. That turns out it's elementary for sigma one formulas. It's elementary for a decent class, but not necessarily all sigma two formulas. And it's elementary for all positive formulas. Positive formulas are formulas that don't use negation and they're allowed to use for all and existential quantifiers. Put them in pre next form to keep it simple. Um, Existential and universal quantifiers, but they don't have negation. And, and, and or, yes, but negation, no. Um, so, so that's not as good as saying it's an elementary subgroup, of course, because there are, you know, sigma three and sigma four non positive formulas all the way up. We don't know yet. I don't know that it doesn't work, but. but so, in this language, the difference is that you can talk about equations, but not in equations. So, yeah. Um, so so let, let, let's, I, I think this is what you're saying here. Let's see. Um, first of all, for, for positive existential formulas, you know, we had the simple procedure that we saw for F equals D composed with G. Um, 
the same thing works even with a more complicated equation. If you're just saying, I have six parameters, F1 up to F6, and I want to know, do there exist G1 up to G4 that satisfy a set of equations, equations only, um, then you just do what we did before. You build a tree, and any the, the path through that tree will correspond precisely to the, the solutions, the equation in R of Q bar, and there will be low paths relative to the parameters that you started with. Okay. Um, for existential formulas in general, with negation, um, what's going on is, let, let's see, yeah, I, I have the example here. Very, right. um, very simple example with negation, there are two distinct automorphisms. That's false in all of F0, right? There's only the identity, nothing else. It becomes true as you go up because you get to a point where the, there certainly are two distinct automorphisms of Q bar, and you get to a point where they distinguish themselves from each other. Uh, in this case, it happens right away, first level up. But um, in general, it may take a while. So I think Roman was getting at this. Um, being unequal is a sigma one property. Like two automorphisms are not equal to each other if there exists an N such that the restrictions to Fn are distinct. And that's existential, but it's not decidable in general. Somebody just gives you two automorphisms and says, are they equal or not? You can check, you can check, you, can check, you know, if one, if two, if three, it looks like they're all equal. But if you ever say they're all equal, you're taking the risk because maybe they diverge each other the way they are. And what we're looking at in these trees, the set of paths through a tree like this, often called a pi zero one class. Some people in the computability seminar heard that term just today. Um, it's defined by a for all property, basically. Um, so, you know, saying as you go up, Everything you give is an automorphism, essentially. Um, so that mixes perfectly nicely with equations, but in equations which are existential, they're sigma one properties, they don't mix as well. Okay. Now, what happens with existential formulas with negation is that since you know there is a tuple G in Q bar that witnesses the equation, you can say, okay, well, at some point here, that tuple produces evidence that the inequations that the inequations hold, right? That, you know that everything's divergent and everything else sufficiently. Right? If you start your tree at that level and sort of look up from there, you can get a path, you know, a, a tuple of G's basically. Um, and so, for sigma one formulas, there is this non-uniform way because you sort of have to know by dumb luck where to start the path, but there is a way of making, you know, getting the existential formula to come down from Q bar to the sky. So we get um, elementarity for sigma one formulas. <coughs> and yeah, so th this is essentially saying the same thing that I just said, you know, pi zero one classes and the tension between inequality and membership in the pi zero one class. Um, so, yeah, so I do want to know still if we take this subgroup that was described in that theorem with the degree B and the C that came from an arbitrary A, um, is it actually an elementary subgroup? It might well be. It's a lot more likely to be than the group ought zero, certainly. But so if, it's open. If you yeah. put it this way, where B and C are no longer, you don't refer to the A anymore. What are the okay. positions well, of well, B? It's sort of piece of A and piece of A. The piece that you got from that from Yeah, a but what a, are the, if you just want to pose it this way, what are the conditions on B and C to, to be a pair that comes from some A? That's, that's not really easy to state, I don't think. Hmm? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I think it. The, the B and the C that you get may actually depend on not just the degree A, but which set you choose in the degree. But you want to sure. something about uh, them being close to A, right? Like that the jump they're, of they're A. They're close to A. The like, uh, yes. Um, the, jump of the, jump, the jump of B joins C, the jump yeah. of even the two of them together equals the jump of A. Yeah. Right? So, so, kind of so, so, so if you take that, just two that have their join is still low, is that enough? 
Um, so I'm trying to formulate this thing without reference yeah, to A. It, it, no, you don't know. It, I, it's, in general, it's not enough because there are low degrees that are not PA relative to A. Okay. In, in lo, yeah, lo, sets that are low relative to A but are not PA relative to A. And that can go either way. PA degrees is this kind of nebulous class. You know, it, it doesn't have any least element or anything like that. In fact, just over zero, there are two PA degrees, both of which are low, and the only degree that's below both of them is zero. So, you know, it's, it's a strange class. It's out of close, definitely. But otherwise, a lot of strange stuff. Um, let me just think what else I want to squeeze in here. Um, so, but this, so it's uh, non complete then, or what? No, what did you prove? Uh, is it actually you closed? It's actually you closed. Um, okay, it's existentially closed within the arc of cube arc, right? Yeah. Not not as a group in general. No, no, no. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's also certainly worth it just to look at. I mean, even just. That, I mean, you could do it for arc B intersect arc C, like we were, or you could just look at individual arc D of cube arc and say, what isomorphism types do you get? Are they same in some cases, in many cases. Um, is there a sort of standard isomorphism type? You know, maybe most degrees give you the same sort of automorphism group here, up to isomorphism, or up to elementary equivalence. And there are just sort of a few weird exceptions out there. These are all good questions. I haven't gone into them at all. So they're, they're just open and out there. Um, but interesting. So, um, I mean, if you didn't care about uh, this uh, D and C being close to A, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't you just do a simple okay. Yeah, so, so first of all, yeah, there, there certainly are, you know, low and untold theorem, right? There certainly are countable elementary elementary subgroups of what Q bar. And you can start with what any any one or any countably many elements you want. Right. So you um, just okay. so, so they, they do it six. Yes, yeah. Um, the idea here is to try to get them more uniform right. somehow. Um, I would have to go through the long wait, 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 wait. to see. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking like are you saying when, that when you want to throw in a witness, oh, you I'm could just I'm going to finish here. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll ask the question without the question. Um, so yeah. Uh, so, so let's see. Last thing, I mentioned Scott ideals here. I mean, that's what we're building using this uniform low basis theorem. Um, and so a Scott ideal is a Turing ideal. It's closed downwards under Turing reducibility. It's closed under taking the join of two elements of the ideal. And it's closed, you don't want to say it's closed under PA degree. If I think of degree A, there's a whole lot of PA degrees. But for every degree A in the Scott ideal, there is some other degree in the Scott ideal. That is PA relative to A, right? So there, there's enough oomph in the ideal to let you find paths through trees, through finite branching trees. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll put that up there, but not say very much. I mean, it, it would be kind of nice if we could use this to look at the Galois group of the absolute Galois group of Q as a direct limit, right? Normally, it's seen as this inverse limit of all finite groups, and you could have done it as a direct limit of low and Scholem produced groups, but if we could do this more uniformly in some way, try to work this out, potentially it might be cool, but that's that's a long way off at this point. Okay, so let me wrap that up. It's 3.31. Thanks very much. As is the tradition with our seminar, <laughs> we had lots of questions already, but uh, are there any further questions for Russell? Sorry, so Russell, the theorem you were saying at the end, is if I just start with any Scott set and look at the automorphisms that are in that Scott set, then it'll have these two, These it'll be an existentially closed submodel and it'll have the property that it's elementary for positive formulas. Yes, uh, I would say Scott ideal instead of Scott set, but otherwise that's exactly right. Okay. Um, yes. Um, you could also go as far as saying, look at 
you know, all the automorphisms that are arithmetic in a degree D. And then I think you would probably get a, a, an elementary subgroup right there. I have to sit and work that out, but it seems likely. Um, that's a lot more firepower. I mean, you know, computability here is I, I want to keep it down. I can't do the A computable automorphisms. At least let's stay close to that. So the sky. But yeah, you can be more expansive if you want, definitely too. So yeah, can I imagine? Did you are you saying that there is at least the degrees, but that of D in that degree is an element? Is no, no, oh, okay, no, no, that's not what we were saying. There okay. might be, I don't know, but yeah. I, I certainly don't have. Okay, it. No. yeah. Um, I don't even know if there's an, a D such as R D is is elementary for sigma one formulas. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Going further up. It does get harder. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to be. Okay, let's discuss this later. Is there any need to quantify this? I haven't looked at that in the least. Hmm. On hand, I don't see why there wouldn't be. That, that may be known for the automorphism for the actual Um I don't know, I'd be surprised. And I mean, the, the view of the absolute I want to the number theory that I sort of suggest is, oh, that's really hard. Um, and I'm not arguing with that, but um, it, it makes one suspect that nice properties like quantifier elimination probably don't hold. And that's not much to make a projection on, but there you are. <laughs> Any further questions? Yeah. I mean, just in terms of that applicability, mm have -hmm. you thought about it? Is it categorically strong? Um, I mean, as I say, what I'd like to do is get some number theorists to work on this, um, partly because I have open questions that I think they could help with, but partly because this might address some questions of mm -hmm. Is that what it around number of the acronym? Um, I, I've never met him. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I mean, I mean one knows the name, but I haven't heard it much lately. So he's very, he's very open as yeah. a person. Mm -hmm. Have you seen him? Like Diakonis, yeah, Percy Diakonis. Um, I mean, again, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty we'll see. Though, but you know, go and show up. Sometimes, like, sometimes it's just luck. Sort of, who do you talk to? He I snaps know. up and says, "Yes, I need you to touch up." We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. That's why I'm going to give talks. <laughs> so, great talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.